It's Leah Piper with Sex Reimagined. And Dr. Willow Brown, your Taoist expert here at Sex Reimagined. And today we have the one and only, the fabulous, the spectacular Lala Jones. Lala's the founder of Lala's Bedtime Tales. She's got a whole podcast, y'all, and you got to tune in and listen to it. Um, She's a sexual wellness educator. She's a writer. She's a, a relationship coach. She reads and writes erotica. And her podcast is basically all these incredible erotica scenes that she has created, that she has written from sources of inspiration within her life, where she then reads them on her podcast. So you can just tune in and get turned on literally just by listening to her podcast, which is called Lala's Bedtime Tales Erotic Stories Podcast. So, you know what to do. She's already named it, baby. Tune in, turn on, and follow along with Lala. Welcome to the Sex Reimagined Podcast, where sex is shame-free and pleasure forward. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the show, Lala. We are so excited to have you here today. Hi, I'm excited to be here. We're so excited to hear about your journey with your writing and erotica and how you open people's minds and help them to reimagine what sexuality actually is. Yes. So I want to know, like, how did you get into the genre? Do you remember the first book you read? Do you remember how old you were? Where did you get your first romance novel? I'm assuming you started with romance. I kind of want to hear your your origin story. So I was really into young adult fiction growing up and a lot of it has to do with like, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend stuff. And so my mom was like, oh, I think you really enjoy romance. So when I was in the eighth grade, one of her friends told her about Harlequin Presents. And so I started reading Harlequin Presents and then my journey just took off from there. I did experience some trauma and through therapy, she said a good way to heal is writing your story and writing it how you want it to happen. So because I dealt with sexual trauma, I started writing erotica to help heal. Yes. What a powerful way to heal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Willow and I have been in the sexual trauma world, helping people heal, helping ourselves heal. Both of us have had, you know, deep journeys of our personal experience and like overcoming those obstacles. This is the first time I've met someone who therapeutically went on a journey by writing erotica. Like this is genius. Okay. So say more about how that helped heal whatever needed healing, assuming that healing was, you know, the name of the game. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. So Basically, what I would do is I would write my stories and I would then create them into like an anti-hero or to the person I actually wanted and how I wanted the experience to be. And then I was just like, anytime I would have a bad day, I would go home, read erotica. I would feel grounded. Um, I deal with a lot of social anxiety and anxiety and uh, clinical depression. And I found that reading erotica would be really therapeutic. And then I got into audio erotica as well, where they put the sound effects and the music behind it that helped. And I was like, why do I feel so good mentally reading and listening to erotic content? So I looked it up and I saw that it had mental health benefits because there's this theory called misattribution of arousal. And some of the feelings when we get stressed also kind of correlate with the same feelings that we feel when we get aroused. So with the misattribution of arousal, if you read erotic content or listen to it or think about a sexual experience, it can help calm you because it's changing those stress feelings into feelings of pleasure that you can feel through um, sexual stimulation or arousing content. Ding, ding, ding. Did you hear that, everybody? With the same part of the brain, let me make sure I get this right. The same part of the brain that experiences anxiety is also the same part of the brain that experiences arousal. And so we can go from fear to excitement. They're basically like the flip side of a coin. And so we can have more power over the things that cause anxiety, over the things that are causing us to be afraid by finding, because that's arousal in and of itself, right? It's like the heightened senses that are happening in the body, the heightened sensations that are happening in the body. So how do you take 
Lala, like, you know, when anxiety just kind of feels like it's, it's hitting you in the gut or feels like it's making your heart beat fast and you have sort of an icky sensation versus like a, uh, like a sublime or like a, the kind of sensation that comes with anticipation or pleasure where everything feels heightened and tingly in a yummy way. Is there a way to switch those sensations to flip the sensations over? And is, and is what you're saying is that happens when you read a few pages of something sexy or you listen to like a sexy chapter? Is that how it works? Yeah. So like for the therapy, what we would do is we would bring in breath work with it as well. So with my therapist, basically also, so through Dipsy, you can play like the sex scenes and stuff. If y'all have, if you don't know what Dipsy is yet, y'all check it out. How do you spell it? D-I-P-S-E-A. I always thought it was pronounced Dipsy, yeah, but I don't know. It's Dipsy. Um, yeah, they they actually, not only do they have erotic stories on there, but they've also got um, like bedtime stories, which Lala is going to tell us about her own bedtime stories. I can't wait to hear about that. But they'll like lull you to sleep. And sometimes it's just like a sexy man's voice playing the guitar, <laughs> you know, and they just put you to sleep. It's a pretty cool really? subscription plan. Yeah. I think you can get a month free trial with Dipsy. Yeah, I love it. And yeah, and it also has two where you can get the sexy voice and they'll like walk you through like a breath work and like meditation and stuff like that. So it's amazing. And so with that, um, if you listen to like the sexy scene or you read the sexy scene that you like in a book, um, it helps with the grounding. And then when I do it as well, I also do breathing. I do a lot of box breathing. So that also helps as well. So while I'm reading it, so that helps my mind get into a clearer headspace and I can use the sexy scene as a grounding if I feel really stressed out. The traditional yoga technique of box breathing is, is you inhale for a count of four, you hold for a count of four, you exhale for a count of four, you hold out for a count of four. So that's the box. So you could do it six. I hold, breathe in for a count of six. I hold for a count of six. I breathe out for a count of six. I hold out for a count of six. So it just really allows your mind to really focus on something other than all the distractions that your mind wants to go to. And it's that slowing down of the breath that you were talking about, Lala, that's so um, crucial to resetting the nervous system, which resets those synaptic pathways in your brain. So therein lies the grounding you've been mentioning. Yes. Yeah, it makes yes. so much sense. Yes. Love and I usually it. do like eight, six, four, two, like in my mind. So yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, like, cool. So that. you can you can you can modulate the length of counts. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so does that does it start with that? Does it start with breath before the story comes in? Where does the breath come in when you're listening? to something especially if you're wanting to like settle yourself yeah so I always start with breath and then I hit the play so for me when I'm feeling frazzled I always have to catch my breath first and then when I feel like I can catch my breath then I'll bring in the audio erotica so then I'll hit the play on the dipsy and then as I do my count with the slowing of the breath bringing it down I can allow my mind to channel what I'm listening to and then that helps on my mind and ground me. We'll be back after a quick break. Awaken Arousal Oil is my new best friend. Like Laura says, holy forking shirt balls. Did it deliver on its promise? I could feel the blood flow and warmth, and that was the easiest I've ever achieved multiple orgasms. This is all natural botanical oils. It is made with CBD because CBD helps relax muscles and it eases tension. This stuff smells so good and it mixes with your pheromones like so good. Get yourself some. Link is in the show notes. Okay. So if I got this straight, you had some sexual trauma as a younger person And then you started reading these books and then you started working with a therapist who was helping you with social anxiety and gave you this form of starting to play with your sexuality by listening and reading these books and then, and then encouraged you to start writing. 
as a way yeah. of processing your experiences. Do I have it so far so good? Yes. Okay, yes. great. And then what happens? <laughs> yeah. And so then I get busy. I start working in corporate America. And this is just like a little side hobby and stuff. But also when going back to when I was an undergrad, I studied women, gender, and sexuality as well as a, another part of my degree. So part of my two degrees, I was one of them. Okay. And I fell in love with it. And because I was always at a sex positive parent. So once I got to high school, that I realized like female sexuality was like this taboo thing because that's not what I was taught at home. And, you know, girls start policing other girls. And so then I was just like, oh, my gosh, like, let me cover up. I mean, not feel like big and proud in the space of sexuality. Wow. And so, yeah, so I kind of like, you know, course corrected the fitter with friends and other people my age. And so I became less sex positive. And then I got endometriosis, which led to vaginismus. And I felt disassociated with my sexual wow. self. Wow. And yeah. so when I started pelvic floor therapy, I got back into audio eroticism I got back into erotica and I got back into writing and I was like looking for spaces to talk more with people that had vaginismus but I didn't see a whole lot of it or like tools they were using outside of kind of like what you learn in public floor ther therapy just so you can kind of have that sense of community and so I was like let me start something where people can understand that erotica and sexual wellness go hand in hand so you can put the entertaining with education but also bringing more attention to sexual women's sexual health and women's wellness so that's how lala's bet i'm close to him <laughs> wow what a great bridge you know i we've i'll probably mention a couple of our interviews because you're really bringing together something cool that is is totally interfacing, right? We just had um, Elizabeth Wood was on. We'll be having her on again to talk to, as a pelvic floor specialist and with the work that she's doing. And I'd never thought that you can take that kind of pelvic floor healing work and, and access pleasure by using this medium. And yeah. one of the things that her work is really doing is, is re- identifying what pleasure is, especially if you have tremendous amount of vaginal pain, vulva pain, um, to be able to look at pleasure through multiple lenses so you don't feel like you're being left behind. And I mean, it makes total sense that this could be accessed in a much more powerful way. This is the first I'm hearing about. Like, we have to spread the word so these two <laughs> things go together. Thank you for bringing this to our audience and to personally my attention. This is so exciting. Yeah, um, I think this, this sort of okay. like pain, pain and pleasure being two sides of the same coin, you know, it's if we can – if we can drop into those places of pain, physical pain, emotional pain, I think it's really interesting your story, Lala, how you kind of did the opposite of most people. Like you came from this really open, sexually expressed, like it was good, you know, it was celebrated in your home family. And then when you got to college, you went the other direction. Seems like most people do the opposite of that. So what an interesting journey that you had. And then the fact that you developed endometriosis and vaginismus after re regressing or pulling back on your sexuality, you know, course correcting, as you said, so that you could fit in with the college kids. Um, I think that that speaks so much to what, what we think about in our minds and what we believe, the, thought, the thoughts that are floating through that we attach belief onto, they really do change our physical chemistry and what's going on in our body. And then what you did so brilliant, you like turned it back around again in this really epic, creative way. So yeah, let's, let's definitely be spreading this because it, it is so brilliant to um, use this pain to turn the dial to find your way to pleasure. And I really yes. feel like you're punctuating this re let's reimagine what's possible, which is what this podcast is all about. And I know you have a podcast, but I think before I want to talk about that, I just want to highlight something you said, which is how women will police each other. And I've never heard it described quite like that. So it's really like touching a chord with me because it's true. 
you know, and I remember feeling sort of policed by like my older brother, you know, sexually mm -hmm. in school and stuff. So there were, there was that and less consciously aware until this moment by you bringing up that type of language is the pure female policing that I received and that I also did. Because yes. I'm also aware that there was this period in my life where I had a friend who was a stripper. And for some reason, I judged it. I, I worried about her. I, I wasn't like, are you thinking, Clary? Why would you want to have this job? You could have any other job. And I now, I mean, wow, I'm like really owning and wanting to own right now. Like, I really regret that. That was a very sex negative position to stand and also just came from ignorance and misunderstanding and conditioning, you know, a belief system that was handed to me for some reason. And I've had to do a lot of work to undo some of that being in the sexuality space as an educator. So I just really, again, want to appreciate that use of language because I feel like it's shifting something in my subconscious I wasn't fully awake to. Um, yeah. so just like I'm bookmarking that for whatever reason, it's, it's arising in me. Um, so I just want to open the floor if there's anything you want to say about that. Also, you know, yeah. the journey of your podcast. Yeah. So you'll see a lot in marginalized communities, um, that will police ourselves and each other. And it typically comes from a place of subconsciously and for protection, because we're told by the higher powers in that society that you have to act and be a certain way to fit in this box and it becomes a survival tactic. So in that, we'll start policing ourselves and others that look like us to keep that negative attention away. So you'll see that a lot with BIPOC communities and the female community, especially how Western society or American society, since we're so Puritan based, how we look at female sexuality and how there's a lot of negative and connotations towards that. So oftentimes you'll see, you know, other women, especially young girls, um, policing to be a certain kind of way to fit that male gaze or that male ideal of a good girl. Um, so, yeah, so that's where that comes from. So through that as well through erotica was actually one of the ways that brought me back to more of a sex positive mind uh, and outlook on sexuality because female sexuality and erotica, because it's typically written by women, yeah. see, shows it as an empowering act and owning that. of the sexuality. Yes. Yeah. Like, I don't know that I've even read a, a by book a by a male author. author that's writing erotica. Um, I'd like to. <laughs> I've I've read some kinky ones, topic. kinky ones by men, and they're they were not a turn on for me, but mm -hmm. they were for other women. So I think that you know one one of the things that you kind of mentioned yeah. in, in your stuff, um, Lala, is oralism kink. Can you give us a one two about what that is and and yeah. how it's beneficial? Yeah, what's that? Yeah, so the oralism kink is basically it's someone who gets sexually aroused through. The sound, and it's not always sexual, erotic sounds. It could be like nature, someone's voice, ASMR, or calming sounds. So it brings any, like, sensation to a person. And, like, I remember I was, like, listening to, like, the Tibetan bowl, and I would feel myself get, like, calm and sexually stimulated. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what is this? So, like, once again, I looked it up, and it's oralism is a kink that people have. Like, sound can turn cool. them on. So, yeah, so what you'll see is, like, a person who is aroused by sound, it's, like, to seeing, like, mindful sensuality. And basically what mindful sexuality is, like, a philosophy, a practice, and, like, a set of skills to, like, Cultivate curiosity, heartfulness, and spirit of erotic exploration. And then also, too, what I think is interesting is that typically with oralism kinks, you'll see it more women uh, versus men. Um, so basically, it's like women do a lot of sensory mapping uh, with their arousals. What they'll so see is true. that women... Yeah, so uh, if women can get more into their five senses it can help in you know like the foreplay process and getting you know more turned on and in the mood so they see that uh, women typically have more of an oralism kink than men. you know i just have to say there is something so satisfying about having your own experience validated 
through someone else talking about so, like right now it's like yes I am very sensory I am very oriented to like if I can just bring my attention to my senses how much more I drop in how much more I'm yes. in my body how much easier it is to get turned on how much more fun it is to feel my arousal like it speeds up the acceleration and I really yes. need that as a strategy sometimes and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who could relate to that too because sometimes we're so in our head and we're thinking about all the things that we should be doing instead of just relaxing and being pleasured or pleasuring someone else. It's like that list just keeps on rotating <laughs> all the stuff you're responsible for that you're neglecting right now, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. See, and that's also too, right? Like if like with exploration of this kink, you can like tune in just simply as you like your partner, like during sex, listening to the noises they make and even yeah. having them talk dirty to you, if that's something that you're interested in. And then if you're solo playing or having a self play date, what you can do is like listen to erotica or just like listen to pornography without actually um, watching it or like oh. you can close your eyes during it and see how that like makes you feel and how that stimulates you as well. Oh, I love it. I love idea. that. So the other day, okay, so I've been going through lots of transitions personally, all again, as usual, it seems like far for the course these days for me, but um, it's been challenging. And so the other day, and I'm a writer, I've been a longtime journaler and longtime writer. And so I'm sitting in my journal, writing early in the morning. And all of a sudden, I just started writing like a whole erotic scene. And I felt so much more present afterwards. I, I've never done that before. It just sort of organically came through. Maybe it was in preparation for our really? interview today. I have no idea, Lala. But tell tell us like about your journey and your process into becoming a writer of eroticism. And also, I'm curious if you um, yeah. if you read it like so that your readers can listen. Uh, you know, to your to your writings as well. Yeah, so that's like my whole podcast. So my whole podcast is like an audio erotica experience. So mm -hmm. what I'll do is I'll write like an actual erotica short story, and they usually go between forty five to sixty minutes. And in that, um, I'll pick like a popular trope that I've been reading or I'm really interested in at that time, and then like I'll go from there and I'll just like start writing the story i usually also try to put in a kink as well like my past story um sweet summer vengeance um it was a lot of bdsm and dom sub with bondage and impact play and so i incorporate that and then also i'll try to do like a calming playlist that goes along with it and then I'll add the erotic sounds as well as some of the other sounds um, of what's going on. So a person can really tap into like all of their emotions and feeling while listening to the story. Wow. I can't wait to listen, tune into your podcast more. Yeah. And the podcast is called Lala's Bedtime Tales Erotic Stories. So I'll be sure to look that up um, on your favorite podcast app. And of course, we'll have a link for it in our show notes. Um, you know, I think right now that's sort of my favorite genre is the BDSM kink space. Do you, um, put one out every week? Yeah. Right now it's every other week. I'll try to get out either two stories a month or one story, but two parts. And I love some of your titles, right? An unforgettable <laughs> mistake. It seems like you put a lot into each episode. So I'm thinking that like the bi-weekly episode yes. makes a lot more sense for all that you're putting together production wise. So your podcast is a little bit like, um, like Dipsy, right? But it's just, it's all coming from you. So you're the main reader and you read all the different characters and you do all the writing and it's all coming from your genius. Yes, definitely. Yes. And a little bit different, probably like my differentiators. I try to do a little bit more music than what Dipsy does. Cause I feel yeah. like I love, love, love Dipsy, but I was like, if they just added a little bit more music. So yeah. I threw that in there. So yeah. Yeah. I also really like that you do like the part one and the part two. I think for someone like myself who loves to binge listen or binge watch, there's something really juicy about that cliffhanger that takes you into the next episode. And tell us a little let's bit see. more, Lala, about how um, how somebody, like let's say somebody's been in a marriage for 15, 20 years and they've been having the same routine sex and they maybe have it like 
twice a week, you know, at best. And it's, it's okay. You know, they both have an orgasm. It's not bad, but how could they use or maybe erotic? Twice a month. Yeah. Or, you know, as the case may be, <laughs> how can they use this erotic? Yeah, right. So, uh, I mean, twice a week's pretty good for a lot yeah, of that's, marriages. <laughs> but depending on what yeah. style of sex they're having, you know, I'm, I'm giving a best case scenario for most long term couples, you know. So, yes. Yeah, so one of my favorite things to suggest is to use it as a way of foreplay and to deepen the connection by reading erotica aloud to each other or listening to it together. And then also while listening to it, I feel like exploring each other's erogenous zones, like in the explicit scene, if they talk about the kissing, like do the kissing, like use it as kind of like a map of how they're like touching each other and stuff like that. And then also... It's a good way to do like kink exploration and fantasy exploration. So you can be like, oh, hey, like I read this in this book or I listened to this. Like, here, you read it or you listen to it. What do you think about this? Or like, I'll even screenshot like my husband's stuff and be like, oh, like this is hot. Like, what are your thoughts about this? And you can use it as an ideal for like role playing as well. And so one of the things that I always suggest is if there's like, um, there's fantasy. So fantasy spicy romance or smut is a really big thing as well so you can use that for like um role-playing ideas like get a scene and like if you're having like a vampire since a lot of people always talk about vampire stuff like vampires are fabulous aren't they i know right (laughs) they're kind of the placeholders for dark sexual energy right where you can kind of go towards the forbidden and they got magic and it's always like one of those first doors, the vampire books that, I mean, Anne Rice, the Anne Rice books. Oh, yeah. yeah. But you can use it for kink and fantasy exploration with a partner, role playing ideas, um, even like things that you might want to try in the bedroom. And then also as a way of foreplay with your partner. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic way to start also conversations with your partner about mm-hmm. things that turn you on, because I think it opens up so many doors doors to understanding desires that you haven't been able to picture yet you haven't been in touch with yet you you don't know exist and then you start reading about these scenes and you're like wow I'm really responding to that and I also love that it's an opportunity to get more courageous Yes. And be more brave about putting words and language to your desires with someone that you can trust, you know, with those desires. Yes. And I just want yes. to encourage the listeners that you hold a really special gift for your partner by being someone who's safe for them to express yes. their desires to. So be, remember, don't make fun of their uh, favorite genre of books. You may not, and it may not be your favorite, but it opens doors for them. And and to hold that as something really vulnerable and sacred and something to celebrate for them, even if you never acted out like this is so healthy for your partner to be tapping into. And and whether or not you ever get to play out the scene or the fantasy, they're going to be more present. They're going to be more embodied. They're going to have access to turn on by understanding that new doors have just opened for them in their body. So I just I'm just plugging that in. Um, and, you know, I know you've got a beautiful blog and I know you write. Have you published any books? Where are you at with that journey for yeah. yourself? So I have an erotic stories anthology. And in that I have 11 short sex stories and I have sexy illustrations and a sexy playlist as well. Mm-hmm. And so I have that and you can get that on Amazon as an ebook. And then piggybacking off of what you said, There was actually a National Library of Medicine study of heteronormative couples. So women that identified as heterosexual cisgender women. And in that study, they showed that those women who read erotica had 74% more sex. So it builds that sexual anticipation for intercourse and Women in in Facebook groups I'm in where women talk about reading erotica, they talk about how they feel more confident in a bedroom because, you know, it normalizes sex for them and it makes them more daring. So makes them more daring. Yes. I love it. And so, yeah, this is a great way for couples to reengage and reignite passion if things have gotten a little sleepy and dull. Have you heard of or read anything by Honeybee Morrison? 
Okay. So for those of you who are new to the podcast, I also want you to be aware of Mary Honeybee Morrison. She's episode 19. If you want to go back and listen to her show, she's a riot. She's wonderful. She's written so many novels, so many female forward. They're the heroes of the book and so many great sex scenes. We adore her. Now there's somebody else I'm curious if you know who we recently interviewed, who has an erotica book subscription. Um, and I think it's a steamy lit is the name mm -hmm. of the have product. Have you lit. heard of Melissa yeah. Yeah. Severdera? Yeah. Yeah, yes. I'm steamy lit. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I really love about the work that she's doing is I think you get like three books in the subscription and you get like a sex toy or a wellness, like a yes. candle. And she's also really bringing attention to different authors, right? People of color, people of indigenous cultures, people who have different sexuality preferences, different yes. um, gender spectrums. And so she's really highlighting marginalized people and bringing their mm. work to the table so that the characters that, that we're reading have so much more diversity. And, um, yes. and so uh, her episode should be coming out soon. And as I sort of deepen my own experience into this kind of self-discovery. I mean, I've said before, like, I'm self-pleasuring in a way that I've never had a relationship to. And as someone who's a sex educator, <laughs> I'm really relieved that I'm tapping into, like, new experiences of myself, my own body. Yeah. Um, I'm finding it easier to find um, my climax it's like that's being easier to reach and also playing yes. with having it like expand and be longer or even to be more multi-orgasmic. I mean, I've understood how to do those things from a tantric and a spiritual yes. sort of lens, but to do it through the written word has been very liberating. And I, I want you to say more about this relationship, I think, especially for vulva identifying owners around yeah. porn versus um, literature. You know, why do we, uh, uh, by and large, the statistics are much higher for women to be drawn towards erotica versus porn? I mean, I love this idea of listening to porn. That ever even crossed my mind. I'm going to do that tonight. Oh, it's um, fantastic. I can't wait to find out how my relationship to porn expands by being able to listen to it. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, women typically find erotic literature more empowering and female friendly than porn. And that's because women grow a relatable emotional connection to the female main character and explore their fantasies through their imagination and sexual fantasies through that erotic literature. And usually with erotic literature, it taps into more senses, like because of the feelings and the romance behind it. And then also too, you're able to visualize yourself as the character in that story versus if you're watching porn you kind of have an idea of like this is what this person looks like and this is what this person looks like but your mind you're able to tap in more and visualize the scene how you want to see it when you're right. reading it or listening to it right you can imagine your own body as the character with pornography i also feel like um it's more male oriented because i think uh penis owners yes. in general are just more visually oriented you know total generalization yes. whereas um vulva owners are more sensory more auditory i personally am an auditory learner which is unusual yes. most people are visual learners but i get so much out of listening to stuff i can learn so much more that way and i can like digest so much more that way so i think that you know um that's just an, an interesting distinction between listening and also reading versus um versus just watching something not to say that you know women don't get off on watching porn because plenty do and it can be very turning, you know, can turn you on for sure. But I love that what you mentioned earlier, Lala, that idea around like turning it on and just listening to it while having your own visualization of what's going on. Yeah. And I think anybody who is addicted to pornography um, could actually use that as a, a way to start start to 
um, you know, move away from their addiction? wean themselves off of porn yeah because i think what i also uh, you really make some great points willow there is a the thing that porn takes off the table for many people is it disengages the imagination in in a lot of ways because we're so relying on the visual stimulation versus that inner stimulation of being in the story and i think the reason why i'm so much more drawn to the erotica niche is because I'm in a story. I get invested in the characters. I want to know what's going to happen next. I love a series. Like I never want to end with the characters. I want to want the next book to be about their friends. You know, like I want to stay on the journey. And I find that oftentimes watching porn, I find myself just fast forwarding to the dirty bits, you know, and sometimes, and I end up longing for the story. It's like, oftentimes Mm -hmm. there's no story. And so I'm going to get bored pretty quickly or it's the worst acting you've ever seen. So you can't yeah. believe the story. So then you're just fast forwarding to the part you like. And with the book, it's so much more engaging. Yeah. Um, I think those are really, yeah, those are interesting distinctions, but you know what else I have to say? It's been reading erotica that I've sort of changed parts of my relationship to porn. Because mm-hmm. as I'm reading, there's really dirty, fabulous scenes and I'm, and I'm reading them and I'm experiencing them. And I'm like, well, I can totally go to those same acts that I've watched in yes. porn happening on the page. And it has, yes. it has created a more open mind. It's, yes. It has taken me into an open mindset and a curious mindset in relationship to porn. Whereas I've noticed I've had a closed mindset or a judgmental mindset in watching some of those scenes versus reading basically the same exact scene on the book. And so suddenly, instead of me going, well, I just like reading better, it's actually created a bridge within like an openness between porn and the book. Do you relate to that? I do. I love that you actually brought that up. Yes, I do. Yes, I definitely relate to that. And then... Going back to what Dr. Willow said as well, like, that's also one of the reasons why women prefer um, erotica is because it delves more into, like, the foreplay, like, the outer course, which is sexual as well. Because when people think about sexual intercourse, they typically think about just PMV sex, which is penis and vagina sex, which, you know... It like leaves out a whole community of people and sexual experiences as well. Yeah. And so through erotica, you see that you get just like a lot more visualization of what sex can be versus what you usually see in pornography. And then also too, going back to what Dr. Willow said, it's more so typically while there are like Melissa and Erica Lust do female friendly porn, it's typically for the male gaze, whereas erotica is more female pleasure focused. And you'll see that connection too when you when they do studies and they've seen that like there was one study that I looked at where they said that was like 151% of women like lesbian porn more than men even if they were hetero cisgender women and this is based on like a porn hub insight right. that we're going to look because it shows female pleasure when it's girl on girl which is what you typically don't get from like pmv sex that's usually represented in mainstream pornography right so i believe it's it's more believable and because the mirror neurons that are happening between that actor in your own yeah. body. And if and if you feel like the orgasm or the pleasure or the anticipation is believable, right? Like you yeah. really see an engagement with the actor and their body, your your body's going to respond to that. It's almost like the actor is teaching your body what it's capable of by having their own experience. And what's interesting about that, and I'm glad you brought that up, is because the porn that I'm least interested in is when I don't believe that the woman is actually yes. having a good time. Same. Now, yes. it could be a belief system, right, of, of opposing, like whatever they're doing to her may not look pleasurable, but if she has the look of arousal and pleasure, I'm going on that journey with her. <laughs> yes, and frankly, I'm, I'm kind of proud of her. I mean, she's really yes. working hard. Like she's having to, wow, they are putting her through it and if she's yes. having a good time i'm like way to go sister <laughs> yeah it is I... so funny there's actually a comic that loves some like 
the really hardcore porn. She's pretty addicted to it. The way she talks about her favorite porn being the really, almost like the woman is being abused, right? Like our storyline can create that message. We've got a story of what's right and what's not right. And sometimes what's not right is the thing that leads us to the biggest turn on. Yes. yes. And so I think that's another interesting correlation is that we've got judgments, right? We have these conditioned ideas of what's okay, what's not okay. And I think especially in the BDSM and kink world, people are so afraid of their darker side of sexual anticipation, right? And and there's so many judgments we have. And I feel like what the books are doing is healing that. Yes. You know, it's helping us see that 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 submissive person who's maybe getting their ass whipped and is going through a humiliation scene, they're actually yes. the ones that are in control. They're not being yes. abused. It's like we're fetishizing our worst fears. Yes. And, and I think that's such an impactful thing to consider. Because when yes. we can fetishize something that we're afraid of, it makes us more daring. I love that word. We can be more daring with ourselves. And the reward by challenging ourselves and challenging our belief systems is a fucking orgasm. Yeah. I mean, what could be more rewarding? <laughs> yeah. What could be I more affirming? Um, what's your take on all of that? Yes, I love it because what you'll see too as in subcategories, dark romance is Mm -hmm. huge. And that's like the possessive, morally gray, anti-heroes, obsessive characters, where in real life, like bully romance is something that you would not necessarily see as healthily engaging in. But in those scenes and stuff where you have this like obsessive, possessive person that doesn't want you around anyone. They want to own your pleasure. Like they want to be the center of your attention, like the way that they write that. And I feel like that's healing too. Also for people who might have experienced some type of trauma, whether it be like abuse of some type to see that written out and deal with those situations as well. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's important that we, that we separate what, what kind of fantasy opens the doors to our body versus what kind of relationships we would accept in our life, right? It's like we can read a book that has some very questionable behavior, (laughs) Yeah, you know, regarding relationships and, you know, someone being manipulative, for instance, someone, you know, you can see a toxic relationship being played out in a book and that can lead you to some very erotic thoughts and feelings and sensations, but that doesn't mean that you're going to choose having that kind of relationship in your everyday life. So it's so important that people don't equate that. Yes. And then, yes. And then also too, like, so one of my favorite authors is Sophie Lark. And what I think she does a good job of is highlighting kink play and BDSM as a way of trauma healing as well. So like there's this last book that I just read by her called Minks that she just put out back in June and she delves into pet play and how there's like a power exchange dynamic in that and some degradation and humiliation and the two characters are healing with each other by incorporating pet play into their sex life and using that scene Cool. And when they're doing the kink play, and I love that she shines a light on that because I feel like oftentimes BDSM and kink get a bad reputation when it can actually be a good way of, you know, releasing anger, stress, and trauma. And she does a good job highlighting that in her books. What are some other recommendations that you have for? for um for erotica like what are some other authors that you really love or some other um places that you could point our audience Mm, yeah so i like maya banks a lot so like i just read everything i'm i've just read every single book of hers i'm i'm like is she gonna come out with something soon All right, the breathless, the breathless trilogy. Oh. Uh, I love that one. I always tell people about that one, and Me then also too. her sweet series. Like those are good ones. And then for those, like I know some people, whether a lot of Fifty Shades of Grey kind of put this more back into the mainstream again. So right. if you were interested in that, another good one is um, Crossfire series okay. by Sylvia Day. Um, And that goes into a lot of kind of like similar with billionaire romance as well. But also there's a lot of trauma healing and kinks as well that goes. What's her name? 
The author um, Sylvia, Sylvia Day. Day. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And then the Salacious Players Club by Sarah Kate. What I like about hers is it's a lot of different kink explorations for different books. So you get like craze kink, voyeurism, exhibitionism, cuckolding, film dom, and brat taming. Cool. Um, group sex dynamics. And I will say like with everything, right? Erotica is entertainment and you take it and learn more education by going to credible sources before, you know, diving into it. So this kind of just gives you an idea. If it's stimulating you while you're reading it, it might be something that you want to go for the research and participate in, or for some people, like I like reverse harem, but um, group sex probably wouldn't be for me. Okay, um, but, right? You know, it helps you kind of see what kinks or fantasies kind of stimulate you. And then also one of my favorite ones is the Cinderella trilogy by Kay Webster, which is like daddy kink, degradation, and humiliation kink, but also it's like a fairy tale retelling. So I absolutely love that. What's the and author then, for that one? Uh, Kay Webster. And then um, another one is, this is like new adult college romance, sports romance. And I feel like it does like a lot of trauma healing to me where it tells you how like, just because you've experienced some type of trauma, you can reconnect with your sexuality and still build healthy and romantic relationships. You see that kind of as an underlining story and it's the Off Campus series by Elle okay. Kennedy. And she's a really good one to like dive into. So. Cool. I've been going through uh, Lexi Blake. I'm nearly done with everything okay. she's ever written. Uh, Shyla Black. Um, okay, yeah. I've been enjoying a lot of her stuff. I just read The Priest. Um, okay. And then The Sinner. And I forget the third book in the trilogy. But having grown up born again Christian and then Catholic. Mm -hmm. And then also in that book, you have the sister that was molested by a priest. So you have the mm -hmm. scandal, right? And then the brother who becomes a priest to kind of avenge or to, to change the culture within Catholicism and to bring back a sense of, of uh, like a, a really rich relationship to God. And so to, to watch him, play out like the sacramental naughty stuff, but to bring the spirit of like the Holy Spirit and what that means, it, it really touched something. She really did a great job of painting the picture that actually sent me back to these spiritual moments as a child where I felt really touched by the spiritual spirit of God, like whatever those moments that are so hard to describe, right? But they hit your soul. They, they, they put you into a state of wonder and awe and you don't feel alone in the world, right? It's like this intangible thing. And then to bring sex into that space. I mean, I think that's why both Will and I have a Catholic background and both studied this ancient mystery school sexuality because of all the spiritual undertones. So to have somebody write about that from this very conservative I mean, Catholicism is right up there with like such a such a tight container, right? You know, as as opposed to other Christian religious communities that are more soulful, you know, like the Baptists have beautiful yeah. music and the and people are like alive with spirit, right? And there's something really shaking the soul in the church. My Catholic experience was a lot of folded laps and super tight ties and no soul, right? <laughs> Except for these really rare moments. Lala, did you grow up with um, with religion? Oh, yeah. yeah. What's your been your experience with it? Yeah. Yes, I'm Baptist, Black church, Black Baptist church. So I definitely know how um, that can really influence your sexuality and, you know, your just overall outlook on sexuality. It can suppress for some people. Um, so yeah, even though I like to say, you know, God made us innately sexual beings. So. Sure did. Yes. <laughs> I've got a colleague that's always says, God created sex and men and women have been fucking it up. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Sure. Right. I love it. <laughs> good. Tell us again about um, the book that people can find. What's the name of your book that people can find on Amazon? Oh, yeah. So it's um, Lala's Bedtime Tells um, Erotic Stories Anthology, okay, Volume 1. Okay, great. And then also this September on the 28th, 
I am doing a spicy romance crash course one-on-one. And whether you're new to the genre or you've been reading it for years, I'm connecting the dots between how sexual health, mental health, and you can improve your sex life using erotica as like your bedroom secret weapon. Ooh, that and sounds the, very intriguing to me. Um, it's Thursday, September 28th. It's $25 right now. I'm doing a $10 off with $10 off Spicy Romance. And you can do it for $15. And it's a 90-minute virtual class. And I'm also giving my erotic anthology ebook a part of that as well. So they can go back and utilize that with the Oh, I'm going to sign up for that right cool. away. That sounds All right. Like- yeah. Okay. Awesome. How do you work with people? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm doing workshops and then I eventually want to move into one-on-one coaching. Okay. Yes. Cool. And so people can tune in to Lala's Bedtime Tales Erotic Stories podcast. And then she's got a written anthology with the same title that you can get on Amazon. And if you do her course, then you're going to get the anthology as a part of the program. Do I've got that right? Yeah. Cool. And you should check out her website because she's gorgeous and her pictures are gorgeous. And she's just the epitome of lush, beautiful, pleasure forward sensuality. So go enjoy everything Lala is putting out there in the world and make your life more pleasure filled. It's what we're here to do is to enjoy our life. And this is such an important part of it. Okay. So we're going to sign off and say, love, 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 love. Thank you so much, Lala. Now, our favorite part, the dish. It's dish time, Miss Willow. It's dish time with Lala. Let's dish it out on Lala. I mean, first of all, just what a lovely human being. And so, you know, humble, so grounded, an erotica writer, an erotica reader, an erotica genius. I mean, I just loved how not only you know fun and playful and sexy she was but just how educated she was she's she's got the whole she's got it all in there yeah yeah and um and a journey that she's been on that really brings to light i love this connection between healing from sexual trauma and story writing and and actually going through the lens of erotica to find your voice to actually rewrite your own story. I, w- I would love to have her back on the show and have her really talk about, w- if she was comfortable, what her experience was and in more detail what she wrote about as her path forward. Like I'd be so curious to be more in her head about what came out through her, what what stories were you know, put on the page as she went through this process. And she worked with a therapist and kind of just, it opened the door to this whole world. And I love all these different genres. Um, I wish I, I'll have to re- listen to it again because some of them are unfamiliar. And I really like to do some searches on the internet, like dark romance was one. Um, I know there's some young adult stuff. I wrote down, I hope you all wrote down some of these great suggestions and authors that she mentioned. I know I did. I, I, and I was running out of stuff to read. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll make sure you've got. Uh, a resource page to uh, do some clicking. So I'm curious, Willow, like what has your journey been in this sort of peer-to-peer policing of sexuality? And, you know, we touched on a little bit of that. You know, she really talked about marginalized communities, especially, and there being a history of policing each other and kind of keeping each other safe. And, and away from dangerous situations, I think, is where it comes from. But I know, even though I'm a cisgendered white woman, have had my experiences of policing myself, policing others, and then breaking all the rules and saying, fuck that. What's been your journey with that? That's a good question. I've never really thought about any of that before, to be honest. Um, I think I, I grew up in a... a strongly policed environment with the Catholic religion being part of it all. And however, my parents were like, okay, you know, you're probably going to have sex before you get married. And they weren't like so attached to that whole concept as much as, as other Catholic parents were when I was growing up. But um, I would say like once I got into high school and people were exploratory and starting to get into sex and my friends and things, 
I think I probably got into sexual experiences a lot earlier than most of them because I was extremely developed. I looked probably five or six years older than I was when I was 12 years old. So I was getting a lot of sexual attention early, early on, like before I was probably developmentally ready for it. So I don't feel like my peers like policed me ever around it. It was more like me guiding them. And I don't feel like I policed them ever. I just felt like I had always had more experience in that realm. And so people would come to me for questions. I mean, I was like always the therapist in junior high, grade school, like from the very beginning, I was the one that people would come to to be like, oh my gosh, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? Everything from like periods and breast development to like kissing boys, you know, I was just way ahead of the game. And so I would just tell them my experience and I would, I would give them the advice that I thought was right at the time. And I was always playing the the little therapist in high school. What's that show? I love that one show where the kid is in high school and his mom's a sex therapist. They're in England. Um, it's called Sex Education. Have you ever watched oh. that? It was yes. fucking hilarious. I love that show. I yeah, that's only how, a I was like episodes, that. But I was totally charmed. Yeah, I was like that kid, except I wasn't charging money for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, I can't wait to to tune in and listen to like the music that she puts into the stories and to see like how far and deep and how you know detailed and explicit not only her work but it's always the curiosity I have when I'm opening up a new book and I'm and I'm either listening or I'm reading a new author and I so enjoy this genre that if I'm not reading it then I'm listening to it as I do chores (laughs) or I make dinner or I clean the house or I'm doing laundry or I'm in the car like it's almost like I want to have it on all the time um except for when I have to listen to other things because of my job (laughs) <laughs> right, right, which is That's similar to, to your job, right? Uh, it's so it all ties together for you. Um, you got to right. check out Dipsy. It's all if kind you of haven't. connected. That's, that's ironic. But yeah, if you haven't listened to that yet, Leah, you would really love it. And I'm definitely going to get this this book, The Priest. That was the one that you were like, you have to get this one below, right? That was the one. Yes. Okay, The Priest. I'm going to get That's right the one. Now. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't recommend a lot of genres or specific books for you. But I really feel like you'll have a because there's a spiritual component to how to it. this author brings, yeah. And she was really named a felt sense of spirit that I've experienced in my life. And I actually, it's through reading it that I felt reconnected to it. Mm-hmm. It's almost like I have felt a little separated from that mm-hmm. spiritual depth I once had. I've I've um I've become more agnostic in my older years and it was beautiful to feel the profundity of those moments in my past when I was definitely not agnostic. So to be reunited with that while reading these awesome sex scenes was very healing actually. It's by it's really Sierra beautiful. And Simone. It's, it's the really the first book. Yes. And I made Matt buy it so that he it's can. It's on Audible it. too. And, um, yes, it's also on Audible. Yeah. Ooh, I'm getting it on Audible. So, you know, it's interesting because she talked quite a bit about sort of the Audible listening yeah. as this sort of meditative, um, uh, energy regulating of one's nervous system. Um, a lot of her work is auditory. I know that you really prefer auditory um, consumption of, of content and learning. And I also do a lot of listening to these books because I can't always be reading. I have to do things in, the, in my life. Well, if only I could just read all the time. <laughs> but you know what gets in my way with the auditory stuff? Hmm. Some of the voices. Like right now, oh, yeah. I'm listening to a book. And I really do like the actor who's doing all the things. Yeah. But he's really fucking up this one character right now because he's got a terrible um, female Southern accent. I mean, he is oh, not yeah. pulling this shit off. And I yeah. am like, oh, you're ruining this book for me. Oh, my God. That's what so do funny. you do? Yeah. I mean, I Sometimes guess listening to nonfiction I always, isn't as bad. 
I always listen to a little bit of the Audible book before I purchase it on Audible because I can't listen to books where the reader is so emphatic and they are just overemphasizing. It's frustrating and annoying and I can't then hear the book. Like what Journey of Souls, what an incredible book. For Ever since I listened to it, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to it's read a great this book. book someday because I couldn't get everything I needed to get out of it because the reader was so effing like an actor. I'm like, just read the words. Just read the book. I can't wait to read my book on Audible, y'all. It's going to be just so Just read good. the book. Anyway. Okay. Much love to y'all. Okay. Well, we'll see you next time. Love, 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 love. Thanks for tuning in. Leah Piper is a tantric sex master coach and a positive psychology facilitator. Dr. Willow Brown is both a Chinese and functional medicine doctor and a Taoist sexology teacher. Don't forget, your comments, likes, subscribes and suggestions matter. Let's realize this new world together.